Hello and welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us today. As I mentioned, this is the third week of the Head and Neck Cancer Survivorship Symposium, which we are holding every Wednesday um, in August. And we're dedicating this month of uh, survivorship talks to different topics um, in head and neck uh, cancer survivorship care. So this webinar today is hosted by the IMEA Foundation of Pittsburgh in collaboration with the Department of Otolaryngology at the University of Pittsburgh. I'm Carrie Fogel, um, the Director of Development and Foundation Relations at the IONEER Foundation, and I'm hosting today's webinar. Um, and today's topic in survivorship is psychosocial and interventions for the mental health of head and neck cancer survivors. And today's panel discussion will be moderated by co-director of the UPMC Survivorship Clinic, Dr. Marcy Nielsen. So thank you again for joining us. With that, I'd like to welcome Dr. Nielsen, our moderator, to begin today's program. Hi, everyone. Thank you, thank you again. I am sorry that we are not in person. Hopefully next year, things will calm down and we'll be able to go back to our normal format. But I'm really excited for the presentation today. Um, the, the group topic is on the psychosocial interventions for mental health of head and neck cancer um, survivors. And we have a great panelist lined up. Thank you to Dr. Um, Danielle McNeil for putting it together. She is an assistant professor in the Department of Otolaryngology in London Health Sciences um, Center in London, Ontario. And I'm gonna actually pass it off to her and she will take over the rest of the presentations. Thank you so much, Marcy. Uh, I'd like to thank you and all the organizers for allowing me to participate and for putting together such a wonderful program. Uh, I've been fortunate enough to be part of the survivorship clinical and research team here in London, Ontario. And one of the areas of survivorship that is of interest to me is the impact of head and neck cancer on psychosocial functioning. There are many aspects of psychosocial functioning and some very effective interventions to improve the mental health of head and neck cancer survivors. I'm very pleased that the following experts in this area were available and willing to present for this session. Uh, I will introduce all three speakers for the session and then they will present in order. Uh, so the first speaker is Dr. Liz Cash. She'll be addressing sleep problems and remedies for patients with head and neck cancer. Dr. Cash is an associate professor of clinical health psychologist and director of research for the Department of Otolaryngology, Head and Neck Surgery, and Communicative Disorders at the University of Louisville School of Medicine in Kentucky. As part of the multidisciplinary head and neck cancer team at her institution, Dr. Cash has instituted services to offer patients supportive psychological care, consulted with the team of physicians on social aspects of treatment decisions, and has acted as liaison to ensure patients receive needed services. In her research, Dr. Cash investigates how the effects of anxiety, depression, sleep disruption and stress response systems may adversely affect adequate head and neck cancer control and survival. Dr. Daniel McFarlane will be speaking about the rationale and strategy for depression prevention and management. Dr. McFarlane is an assistant professor in the Department of Medicine and the Department of Psychiatry at the Hofstra School of Medicine and assistant attending at Lenox Hill Hospital, Northwell Cancer Institute in New York City. He is a medical oncologist specializing in head and neck psycho-oncology. His research interest is in inflammation and depression in cancer settings and professional development. And finally, Dr. Amy Williams will be speaking about body image distress after head and neck cancer. Dr. Williams is a fellowship trained clinical health psychologist, is the director of research for the Department of Otolaryngology, head and neck surgery at Henry Ford Health System in Detroit. As a core member of the multidisciplinary head and neck cancer team within the Henry Ford Cancer Institute, Dr. Williams works with patients and their families providing psycho-oncology psycho services across the care and survivorship spectrum. Additionally, Dr. Williams works closely with the surgical, medical, and radiation oncology teams as the patient moves through treatment, helping the patient and their support system better understand the psychosocial needs and impacts of their treatments and the medical team to better understand and partner with the patient and their support system. Uh, in her research, Dr. Williams examines the role of social support, psychological distress, cognition and literacy and other psychosocial and socioeconomic variables on cancer care and care disparities in head and neck cancer. So thank you to all three of you. I feel very honored that you're able to present today. Uh, and we'll start off with Dr. Cash. 
Thank you very much for that introduction. Welcome everyone. I'm going to start us off with a discussion about sleep and sleep difficulties for our patients with head and neck cancer. And I will discuss some strategies to help remedy those uh, sleep difficulties as well. So disturbed sleep is one of the most common symptoms reported by cancer patients. And there are a host of negative consequences that are associated with poor sleep. And these consequences can impact the medical and emotional well being of individuals with cancer. Sleep disturbance often spans the course of cancer treatment and proceeds well into post treatment survivorship uh, phases. Sleep difficulties peak at different times during the cancer trajectory. In some patients, uh, they find that their sleep difficulties are most common in the period immediately surrounding diagnosis, so just before and, and prior to starting treatment. Other studies have found that sleep disturbances might begin or even worsen during cancer treatments. And although um, sleep may improve after cancer treatments end, it often does not return to the pretreatment or baseline level and problems can continue for months to even years after diagnosis and treatment. So, um, and, and this is the case for um, patients, uh, regardless of the type of cancer they have, we see that sleep difficulties can become uh, a chronic problem in cancer patients. And some studies estimate that this can occur in as much as 95% of, of cancer patients who were surveyed. So, um, and the rate could even be more pronounced for patients who have advanced cancers due to the significant and at times uncontrolled symptom burden that they might experience, which contributes to poor sleep quality. There are several factors that contribute to sleep problems. Um, first and foremost, some patient, patients are just at greater risk for experiencing sleep difficulties, and those include patients who have a genetic predisposition, um, patients of an older age, patients who are female and those with a tendency to sort of worry or ruminate um, on stressful topics. There are certain precipitating factors as well. So um, the stress of receiving a diagnosis of cancer um, can contribute to sleep disruptions and the uh, symptoms and uh, you know, si side effects of treatment, the uh, treatment itself, medications related to um, a a cancer treatment, uh, as well as you know, just the, the disease process itself, all of these are factors that can contribute to sleep disruption. In addition, uh, certain uh, factors that patients may engage in might perpetuate sleep difficulties. So these may help um, contribute to sleep disruption over time, even after the triggering event, such as uh, cancer and treatment have passed. So these are compensatory behaviors that folks may engage in, such as taking daytime naps, or spending a lot of time in bed watching TV, um, or just spending time in bed worrying, kind of letting their, their thoughts race. Um, and then sometimes folks might develop unrealistic expectations about sleep, such as how many hours of sleep they should get every night, or what time they should be going to bed, or what time they should be getting up. And we find that, you know, many times these behaviors are helpful um, or, or sort of adaptive in the short term. Um, because they help folks um, make up for sleep that might have been lost the previous night, or they might be, you know, necessary during recovery. We might have physicians um, explaining to our patients that it's important for them to rest and recover to let their body heal um, during and after treatment. But over time, these compensatory behaviors can become habits, and they can contribute to long-term sleep problems. Uh, one challenge is just the uh, simple recognition of sleep problems. Oftentimes we find that uh, patients might delay seeking medical advice for, for um, their sleep problems uh, owing to several factors, one of which might just be a lack of awareness about the importance of sleep in terms of overall health. Uh, there may be a preference for non-drug treatments. I have seen a lot of patients say that they, they would rather take as few medications as possible. They don't want any more. And so they're worried that if they uh, discuss sleep problems, they might be prescribed another, uh, another medication, which they might not want. Um, they may also believe that their sleep is just a, you know, a natural response to a stressor in life such as cancer and that it might resolve itself over time, um, which is a, a valid way to believe, um, you know, the experience and response to cancer, everybody responds differently. And so sleep disturbances, you know, might be a very natural response. Um, and it's when they don't resolve over time on their own that we would want to interfere or intervene um, to make sure that patients are getting the help that they need. Uh, and this is because when sleep problems go untreated, they contribute to uh, negatively impact on a patient's mood. It puts them at risk, uh, increased risk for experiencing depression. Uh, it can increase the experience of physical pain and uh, symptoms related to uh, cancer treatment and side effects. It can increase fatigue or negatively impact quality of life. 
and uh, impair uh, activities of daily living. So um, just general, generally being able to get up and get out of the house, get to appointments on time can be more difficult when uh, someone is experiencing a disrupted sleep. Um, it can make it difficult to attend their treatments, get to the treatments on time, or get to all of those um, appointments. And importantly, sleep disruption over time can impair immune function, which uh, makes it more challenging for a patient's body to sort of fight back against cancer processes and can possibly increase healthcare utilization from patients who are experiencing significant uh, problems from this. Um, and then I think importantly, uh, insomnia, uh, clinical insomnia itself is associated with increased rates of all-cause mortality. And so we have you know, some evidence to suggest that there may be some long-term outcomes that are um, detrimentally impacted when uh, someone suffers from sleep disruption for a long period of time. So if these sleep difficulties can start at any time and they might not be readily reported by patients, what are some things we can do to help address these concerns and make sure patients are getting the help that they need? So the first uh, strategy I'd like to discuss is, is just a simple basic educational intervention. So this is something that you know, any, any one of us can use to help encourage our patients to engage in behaviors that might decrease the likelihood of developing um, a sleep disorder or a sleep uh, disturbance. Um, and one such simple intervention might just be that to mention that, um, you know, we might be aware that uh, someone is engaging in these co compensatory behaviors, such as increasing their daytime naps or spending a lot of time in bed to rest and recover. Um, and so it's just helpful to remember that um, while those compensatory behaviors might be necessary and helpful during um, a stressful event, they should be viewed as temporary. And that should be something that once those strategies are no longer needed, that the patient is able to, to sort of decrease the amount they're using those strategies and help get back to sort of a um, regular routine uh, sleep schedule. We can increase public awareness about sleep difficulties by simply providing brochures in, in clinics and waiting rooms and offering informational seminars for patients and caregivers, such as this one, for example, to help increase awareness about sleep and how, it import, how important it is for health and what we can do uh, to help mitigate sleep problems. Another simple strategy is one we call uh, sleep hygiene. And this really is the, um, the idea to focus on healthy lifestyle factors that promote sleep and discourage behaviors that are detrimental to sleep. So the major tenets to this are things like avoiding caffeine in the afternoon, um, a lot of folks say that they might need that caffeine to kind of get through the end of their workday. And, and while that's definitely um, helpful as a compensatory behavior, what we know is that the half-life of caffeine is about five to six hours. So even late afternoon caffeine can definitely still be impacting our body when we're laying down trying to sleep at night. So we encourage folks to avoid it if at all possible, or at least don't have any caffeine after say like 2 p.m., for example, if they're having trouble sleeping. And then you know, in terms of nighttime behaviors, we um, try to remind folks that within two hours of bedtime, it's best if we um, don't exercise, don't drink alcohol, don't have any nicotine, and don't have any heavy meals, because all of these have been shown to impact um, how deeply we can sleep at night. And, and sometimes, uh, you know, when they have trouble falling asleep <clears throat> or staying asleep because of these activities. Although some recent research has shown that exercise might not be as sleep disrupting as we initially thought. And so the current recommendation really is to um, err on the side of exercising. If it's down to exercise versus no exercise during the day and you're already close to bedtime, it's better to go ahead and do some mild exercise just to get the exercise in rather than skip the workout completely. Another simple strategy uh, or set of strategies that we often teach uh, folks who are dealing with sleep uh, difficulties is uh, stimulus control. And um, we incorporate this with sleep hygiene because often we find that sleep hygiene itself is not effective as an intervention. We want to give a little bit more um, so that patients can, can have both daytime and nighttime activities that are, that are helpful to them. So stimulus control is one that we add to sleep hygiene, and it, it essentially gives um, a set of rules to help us kind of retrain the body and mind in order to help us relearn to associate uh, the bed with sleeping rather than um, laying awake and reading or watching TV or doing something else. Um, during the day or in the evening hours. And so what we recommend here is that um, if naps are going to occur, again, um, those are quite common as compensatory strategies, we recommend that folks try not to take naps after 3 p.m. So those naps could come late morning, early afternoon, but if they come late in the afternoon or, or in the evening, they are more likely to disrupt sleep or make it difficult to fall asleep. Um, we 
recommend that folks keep it short to no longer than uh, 90 minutes at most. It's 30 to 60 minutes is usually ideal for a nap. Any longer than 90 minutes and you start to reset your daily um, circadian rhythms, it makes it more difficult to fall asleep at night. Um, avoiding TV uh, and, and reading and doing things other than sleep while in bed is often important because as I mentioned, we start to associate things that we do while we're awake with lying in bed and the brain um, sort of disconnects the um, behavior of or the act of sleeping with being in bed. And so what we really wanna do is make sure that um, get the, the act of getting into bed kind of sends a strong signal to our brain that this is where we sleep. This is the time to sleep. It's time to kind of sort of uh, ramp everything down for the day and start to calm things down so that we can fall asleep. Uh, maintaining consistent bedtimes and wake times is really important as well. And especially we think that um, most importantly is probably that wake time. So because it sets the amount of uh, sleep debt you'll occur, you'll incur over the course of the day. And uh, we wanna give sufficient time for that sleep debt to build up so that you feel drowsy and are able to fall asleep the subsequent night. So um, getting up, you know, as early as possible on more days than not um, when you're able to is, is often one of the strategies that we recommend. Of course, this is, you know, different for every person. Every person has different work and, and medical appointment and, um, uh, you know, leisure activity schedules. And so we think that really consistency here is the key. Uh, and then sometimes folks find that they, they lie in bed awake and they have trouble sleeping. Their mind is racing, the thoughts are going. And so what we often recommend is that, you know, give it 15 to 20 minutes. If you can't get to sleep, get out of bed and do something else. Don't do, don't, we don't recommend exercising or, or doing anything very, um, that's going to, you know, be very stimulating and, and wake you up, but do something that's calming, like, you know, um, getting out of bed and going to another room to watch TV or to read a book um, with a dim light or lamp. Um, I had one um, person tell me that she uh, really found it helpful to do things like rearrange the junk drawer in her kitchen because it was really boring and it would help her feel more drowsy and then she could return to bed when she was sleeping. So different strategies work for different folks and, and um, it always helps to find what works best for you. Another strategy that is used a little bit less frequently, but one of my favorites is light therapy. So this is the use of these bright light devices to help um, sort of reset your circadian rhythms at the beginning of the day. Uh, and it helps to establish or reinforce a regular sleep-wake schedule. And studies have shown that, that the use of these lights in the morning hours can help improve sleep quality and sleep timing. Uh, it helps um, overcome sleep inertia as well. So if you wake up feeling groggy and drowsy, these lights are really effective in helping you sort of, um, you know, just like a cup of coffee to kind of give you a little bit of a boost to help wake you up. Um, we typically recommend that folks use these lights for no more than 30 minutes a day. So there are um, large ones like in this image, but they're also smaller ones and you can get them on um, you know, Amazon or other at, available at other retailers and you can turn them on while getting ready in the morning. Um, it, so you don't have to sit there and, and sit there with your eyes closed, sort of directly facing the lamp. You can have it on in the room with you and that is enough, usually bright light to help. We find that for cancer patients that they have commented that these lights um, helps reduce their fatigue and helps maintain their quality of life. So they feel better throughout the day. Uh, similarly at night, we know that light from devices such as TVs, mobile phones, um, computers, they emit blue wave light and that blue wave light is particularly good at disrupting our, our regular circadian rhythms and helps keep us awake at night. Um, there are special receptors in the retina designed specifically to detect this blue light. And so because of that, uh, anti-blue light glasses have become more and more popular in recent months and uh, over the course of the past few years even. So you can, uh, again, purchase these uh, pretty much at any major uh, real retailer. We recommend folks start using these about two hours before they start to go to or plan to go to bed that night and use these while they're reading, watching TV or playing on their phone. And that helps decrease the amount of blue light that reaches the retina, which helps prevent those daily signals from resetting. Another strategy that we find that um, is often recommended and that, as I mentioned, some patients might be reluctant to engage in is the use of medications for sleep or pharmacotherapy. Um, what we find is that early in the onset of sleep disruption, pharmacological therapy might be appropriate and helpful, um, especially if it's used in combination with some of the behavioral strategies we've mentioned already. Um, however, you know, um, what often happens in practice is that medications are prescribed when sleep problems become chronic. 
And again, part of this is just the, the limited recognition of sleep disruption um, as a problem, as well as, you know, it takes some time before, um, you know, uh, uh, physicians might become aware of sleep disruption uh, difficulties. Um, but what we find in the evidence is that pharmacological interventions at this stage are less effective. So, um, and the American Academy of Sleep Medicine even recommends that sleep medication not um, be used for periods of time greater than four weeks. And we find that when individuals stop those medications, the insomnia they experience often rebounds. And so um, because of that, we find that the combination of, of behavioral strategies really does um, provide a lot more benefit than just pharmacological uh, therapies on their own. And in additional consideration, you know, a lot of uh, patients who are dealing with their cancer treatments have, you know, a lot of other medications they're taking, such as anti-anxiety medications or narcotic pain relievers. And when you combine those with certain sleep aids, you you um, you may see some combined sedative effects for some patients, and so they may experience more daytime drowsiness, um, and they might experience some impairments in their cognitive function. Certainly, older patients are in at increased risk of falls uh, when they um, have polypharmacy um, needs such as this. And so we often try to avoid the use of uh, pharmacotherapy for, for patients who might be at greater risk for polypharmacy. Uh, and hopefully one study has at least found that um, when we discontinue sleep medications, it does not tend to result in significant sleep disturbance, but it does improve cognition significantly. So um, in, in general, the recommendation here is to, to really try to use the uh, first line strategy, which is the um, behavioral approaches that I mentioned, plus some more, and, and then those can be used in uh, combination with pharmacotherapy. So uh, the American Academy of Sleep Medicine has designated um, an approach called cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia as the first line approach for sleep disorders. It has demonstrated nice strong effects in um, the multitude of research literature that has come out about it. It's shown that its effectiveness can be as good, if not better than sleep medications. Um, at least in the short term, and it has benefits over the long term. So when you stop medications, they'll stop working. But um, even after a course of this treatment, CBTI is completed, those effects can carry forward because uh, patients learn these strategies and they start to incorporate them in their daily lives. And, and of course, um, cognitive and behavioral strategies are safer than sleep medications. We don't have the risk of polypharmacy. We don't have the um, uh, the worry about uh, detrimental side effects or interactions with other medications that we might be concerned about when treating pharmacologically. So the CBTI components, I'll just go over them briefly. Um, some of them you already know now. So I've given you the sleep hygiene and stimulus control tenants. Those are sort of the overarching themes. Now, if someone um, were to engage in CBTI, those might be tailored or adjusted or added to or, or um, uh, you know, uh, amended in some way so that they fit the particular needs of, of the individual patient based on what they're experiencing. Um, other tenets include relaxation training. So there are several pre-recorded and um, readily available guided uh, relaxation, guided imagery, um, meditation uh, techniques that are available to, to patients to use. And I have um, heard of folks like that they like to have these recordings with them and they can use them either during their radiation treatments or even at, just after to help or before to help them relax and kind of um, be able to sort of manage, you know, uh, going through their radiation a little bit more effectively. Um, under the guidance of a trained clinician, sleep restriction or compression can be instituted which is uh, the notion that, as I mentioned before, we often find that folks will lie in bed, but not sleep. And so they have, um, you know, maybe this, this much time in bed at night, but only this much of it is sleep. And so what we start to do is compress that amount of time they spend in bed. And that can be done gradually, or it can be done all at once um, until the sleep uh, starts to become more efficient and more of the time spent in bed is actually spent to sleep. And then we start to gradually increase that amount of time spent in bed to in increase the amount of sleep that a person is getting till they get to their um, uh, preferred amount of sleep per night. And then of course, um, probably one of the, the most major components of CBTI is cognitive therapy. And so that really focuses on cognitive restructuring, which is used to help identify thoughts and beliefs that might contribute to the development of or reinforce behaviors that um, uh, preclude good sleep. So con common distortions that are addressed in the course of treatment might be things like, you know, if, um, if I can't sleep, then I should just stay in bed and close my eyes and try to rest. 
or um, my life will be ruined if I can't get good sleep. So we really take the um, strategy of uh, making sure that we address those thoughts, figuring out what the root of them is, figuring out how to address them in, in productive and constructive ways and, and find ways to make sure that they don't interfere with, with good sleep. And then relapse prevention is probably where CBTI um, shows uh, you know, a benefit that sort of outlasts that of pharmacotherapy. And that is because um, these intervention strategies can integrate the cognitive behavioral and educational components, all of which are listed here in the bullets that help promote adherence to the treatment and then help the um, patient identify high risk situations or um, potential triggers for sleep loss and start to incorporate those strategies <clears throat> into their daily lives. And they can use that going forward. So that's a skill that they learn. It, it kind of gets put into their cognitive toolbox, if you will, and uh, they can be flexible and adjusted depending on whatever the daily needs of the patient are um, in order to, to meet their needs. So um, we find that you know there's a lot of strong support for CBTI. We have a lot of um, um, evidence to suggest that it's a really good intervention. However, finding folks who are trained in CBTI and able to deliver this uh, intervention uh, effectively for patients can be a challenge. And so I wanted to be sure to mention some resources that are available, uh, that are publicly available for both practitioners and for um, the general um, uh, you know, audience so that um, folks can make sure that they're getting um, access to, to these treatments if they need them. So um, there are three different websites that, um, that I wanted to bring up. Um, uh, full disclosure, I'm not affiliated with any of these researchers or any of these websites. And so, um, I know of them through um, sleep research societies, and these are vetted by um, you know professionals who have created them, and they have in evidence evidence base to back them up. Um, and the the first one here on the list, Sleepio or Sleepio, uh, was actually designed by one of the um, psychologists who um, developed the original models for for CBTI. So this one has um, really um, got a strong evidence base behind it, and and has helped lots of folks. And so. This um, gives an option for um, individuals who um, are sort of just trying to figure out if, if CBTI is gonna work for them. Um, the web-based interventions offer the convenience of in-home sessions, which is really nice. Some of these are FDA approved and, um, uh, some, and uh, much of this work can be covered by insurance too if you have um, mental health benefits on, on your insurance plan as well. So SOMRIST is another um, well-vetted program that uh, a lot of folks have uh, given positive reviews for. And then CBT for insomnia.com or CBTI um, is another um, clinician-led intervention website that um, is easy, readily accessible. And then of course, um, there are many mobile apps that are designed to uh, address a variety of different issues related to sleep. So the first one uh, that I wanna highlight, these are all free, first of all, um, and available on the, um, you know, wherever you get your apps for, for your phones. CBTI Coach is one that was designed by the VA. And so it has a lot of research behind it. It's designed to be used in conjunction with a practitioner while you're completing a course of CBTI. But I find that there are a lot of uh, modules in that app that kind of stand alone and that work well um, solo. And then, um, you know, sleep cycle, sleep time, and pillow, those are all other ones that are designed to use the functions of your phone to be able to give you feedback on how you're sleeping. So some of these, you know, you, you turn the app on, you put the phone under your pillow at night, and it kind of monitors how much you toss and turn, gives you an estimate of how well you sleep um, or how poorly you sleep, and then you can develop strategies to kind of figure out where to go from there. Some of them also have great um, relaxation um, recordings and, and meditations and things that you can listen to to help you fall asleep too. So again, these are all backed by a solid evidence base. And so I wanted to make sure that um, I point these out as well so that folks can access them if they need. Uh, and so I think that about covers everything I wanted to make sure I addressed today. So thank you very much for your attention. And I think, um, we may be just a little bit over time for me. So what um, I might do is go ahead and turn it over to the next speaker and then we'll save questions for the end, if that's okay. Yep, I think we'll answer all the questions at the end. Daniel, are you ready to share your screen? Yes, I am. I am just going to pull up I don't know why the PowerPoints, oh, there it is, okay. Go from the beginning. <clears throat> I 
just want to make sure everyone can see that, uh, my PowerPoint. Looks good. Great, thank you so much. Um, right, so pleasure to be here, everyone. So um, Daniel McFarland, I will be talking about uh, depression in the head and neck um, survivorship space. Um, and I'm actually approaching this topic sort of as both a medical oncologist seeing patients with head and neck cancer, especially in follow-up, and also as a psychiatrist because I see patients for depression, et cetera. And so I'm giving a very broad overview um, that deals mostly with, with concepts that I think could be helpful for clinicians uh, seeing in the medical area, seeing patients um, you know, in follow-up, et cetera, and kind of what to be thinking about in terms of depression. Uh, just very generally, uh, we have this wonderful field that has now incorporated patient reported outcomes not that long ago. Um, patient symptoms uh, were not seen as valid unless a doctor sort of uh, validated them. Um, within my lifetime, that has changed and, and really, um, uh, I think, made care much better, of course. Um, and so that's essentially um, the basis of our whole field in psychooncology and looking at uh, what happens to patients emotionally uh, as they go through cancer treatments. Um, in the head and neck area, of course, we have um, uh, also somewhat changing demographic with, uh, with more HPV related oropharyngeal cancers, but we still see that 75% of patients with head and neck cancers have smoking histories and, and alcohol histories, which of course are also associated with depression. Um, and so, um, so there's that issue, right? And, and survivorship that may carry forward. Um, uh, in the survivorship space, of course, um, we're seeing thankfully less uh, dis disfiguring surgeries, more, but more and more functional impairments in terms of swallowing. Um, and again, uh, I probably don't have to point out, but as uh, symptom number and severity increase, the prevalence of depression goes right up along with it. Uh, they really go very much hand in hand. Um, from the American Cancer uh, Society, uh, they estimate that basically 80% of, of patients as they go through head and neck cancer treatments experience a social disruption. Probably uh, no coincidence that depressive symptoms are seen in roughly the same amount of patients. Um, very high number. And in fact, uh, prevalence rates across the board always sort of show that patients with head and neck cancers um, are, are, are among the cancer types at the top of the list with depression, depressive symptoms. And again, um, this has to do with feeling of self-worth, uh, diminished sense of self, um, and experiencing that kind of negative psychosocial impact. Um, that may be fragile to begin with, uh, and of course, uh, issues of, of daily life. I think it's important to note um, that the difference between depressive symptoms and categorical depression, um, this is a little bit of an esoteric issue, mainly because studies that show the, the negative outcomes with depression are mostly looking at depressive symptoms. And that's actually what we're talking about mostly. Um, and so what that means is like a self-report scale as opposed to folks who have a, um, a clinically based, uh, you know, interview for depression necessarily. Um, and of course, these symptoms, as mentioned earlier, with uh, the physical symptoms, there's a huge overlap, but also with other psychiatric issues such as, uh, um, uh, well, mostly anxiety, right? Uh, and um, by the way, I'm talking mostly about depression because most of the uh, not that anxiety disorders aren't associated with poor quality of life, but when it comes to survival, we're seeing more and more data coming out showing that depression, uh, while you're undergoing combined modality therapy, leads to more, uh, you know, to, to inferior cancer-related um, survival. And this is actually seen across the board in all cancer types. Um, and so, anyway, back to what I was saying in terms of the overlap, um, also overlap with, with other things like um, other types of psychiatric disorders. And so um, the end of the day, what we really talk about is functional impairment, executive functioning, those ADLs, et cetera. And when you think about, well, you also have physical impairments and how much of that functional impairment is due to the depression or due to, to, to some other physical issue or how much of it is then normalized, right? Um, you can see that it's, it's very murky. Um, and that's actually one of the main take home points I wanted to, to to, to express is, is the chameleon-like nature of depression. And I think when you look at guidelines and you look at criteria, you would think, oh, well, this seems very straightforward, right? Um, but it is a great masquerader. 
And even though um, with like the PHQ-2, which says, you know, if the patient says they have depression or if they experience a lack of, of experiencing pleasure, right, which is called anhedonia, you know, that's highly predictive of depression. But even still, many patients who've never experienced depression before won't really understand that, that they're actually having depression. So um, it's something to just kind of really be, um, have, a, have a look out for, and of course, use those self-report scales, which I'll get to in a minute, and also attention to the history. And I would I would say to divide, um, you know, again, with, with some of those um, comorbidities, um, you know, has the patient ever had depression before? Is there a family history of depression, personal history of depression versus depression that starts afterwards? And the reason is because also um, as, as we talk about what do we do, how do we incorporate treatments? We, we talk about coping, skills to cope, et cetera. Um, and what might be different at this point, right? Um, someone who's never gone through this before might be trying the same coping skills that worked in another scenario that aren't gonna work in this scenario. Um, I kind of alluded to that issue of categorization for kind of meeting major depressive criteria versus symptoms. We also talk about symptom clusters because obviously these things cluster together. Um, and um, there are, in essence, different kind of flavors of depression. Um, we used to talk about atypical depression, you know, the sort of thing where like, well, you don't sleep very much or you sleep too much, you don't eat much, too much, you eat too much, et cetera. But it also can be with, in terms of how you feel about yourself, or is it sort of a lot of anxiety, but there's underlying depression, et cetera. So th th this is important in terms of um, uh, applying the right treatment modality, of course. Um, and I will just mention that, of course, we don't have a biomarker, unfortunately. This is really the holy grail. Now, there are changes that we definitely see, and that's part of my research in terms of looking at inflammation. Um, but we're not really at the point where, you know, that's part of sort of cinching the diagnosis. Um, it's still a clinical diagnosis. Uh, and I would make a plug for that sort of longitudinal assessment, which is just so important, collateral information, et cetera. Um, and obviously our approach to how we talk about these things, especially um, in the kind of like frontline sort of follow-up surveillance setting is, is really important. Um, as I mentioned before, number and severity of physical symptoms, predictive of depression. Um, yeah, other, other kind of um, syndromes that go along with depression, demoralization is just sort of the giving up of hope. And of course this, this aligns with changes in role, changes in family structure, et cetera. Um, anger and bitterment, et cetera. So these can also be uh, part of depression. Um, these PHQ-2 questions, just if, if you don't kind of have them on the back of your mind, they're just so important uh, in terms of um, just quick one, two, let, let, me, let me see what's going on. Um, and again, you might wanna be really paying attention to patient sort of social situations, right? If they're presenting in clinic, maybe they wanna put their best foot forward. They're not gonna, Many, many patients don't want to talk about depression when they're seeing their surgeon or their radiation oncologist, medical oncologist, because they want that, that doctor to do, you know, they don't think it's their prerogative to, to talk about these things. So um, the best predictor of whether a patient gets treatment for depression, anxiety, or follows up with mental health is if the, if the non-mental health provider recommends it and how they recommend it. Uh, is just key because also you're dealing with a lot of um, stigma. And so we can help with that by um, um, uh, validating uh, these kinds of uh, symptoms. A note about suicide. So in general, uh, about this, the average rate of suicide across the board for patients with cancer is twice the normal population. Head and neck, unfortunately, is one of the areas of cancer that has the highest levels of suicidality. Within that, Timing is crucial because um, within the first month, even the rate is about 13 times the normal population, the first year about five times the normal population. And so it sort of gradually goes down, but you're talking about a diagnosis, starting going through treatment, a, very, a lot of institutes are, and centers are now implementing suicide screening. So this is the reason, and if anything, just remember the timing. Um, it, and I'm going to kind of move through through a lot of this. I think I can kind of um, uh, get get. I think I kind of covered that. Interestingly, you know, when I go to the American Cancer Society um, recommendations, so first recommendation, you know, screening for sur or surveillance for recurrence, great. Uh, second is um, any new cancers, great. 
And third, we kind of have all of these, uh, you know, psychosocial issues lumped together, physical issues, psychological issues. Now it occurs to me that distress, anxiety, and depression are number 22 <laughs> after a lot of other issues, which are very important issues. But I would make the claim that as, if, if social disruption is, is you know, four fifths of patients have that issue and, and almost the same number have depressive symptoms, it's sort of intercalated throughout all of these other things. So their recommendations start screening um, three months post-treatment and then at least yearly with a validated tool. And obviously at any time point that it, it seems clinically appropriate. appropriate. Um, and again, relationships and uh, daily life. Their recommendations, the ACS in, in office counseling with access to, to, to uh, pharmacotherapy. Um, and, um, you know, I would also make the, make the plug that our, the way that we approach this is, is very important as, as oncologists because, you know, in, in the psychological area, we talk a lot about sort of termination of therapy and what that means for patients. And of course, everyone knows that patients get very attached. Um, and if you think about the acculturation that we have them go through, you know, we tell them you're gonna have to come every day for combined modality therapy, et cetera. And, and they kind of have to acquiesce and do all these things. And then we sort of abandon them, right? And so we have to sort of prepare patients for that transition. Um, and likewise, encourage this kind of reintegration and that adjustment um, and, and really kind of understand that as a stressor for, for them. Um, and so I'll just mention as well um, in our sort of toolbox, we basically have therapy. Um, the most that has been used in cancer settings is supportive expressive therapy. Um, there's individual versus group therapy. There's, um, I will just say also that support groups are, are primarily uh, for information, not necessarily like a process group for, um, for, for these kinds of things, but um, it, cognitive behavioral therapy, interpersonal therapy, um, insight-oriented therapy. And then, and then we have a whole host of mind-body therapies with like mindfulness kind of situations um, that are extremely important I uh, would use a lot of the mind-body therapies as sort of adjuvant um, treatments or adjunct treatments rather for depression. Um, so you do wanna make sure that you're talking about a kind of first line treatment. Briefly, psychopharmacologically, um, patients are on medications for sleep. We just heard about how important sleep is, anxiolytics, sometimes stimulants. If you think about our antidepressants, um, they are the, the, the SSRIs right now that you know, we're using are generally very safe medications. Um, they are typically not titrated up, which tends to be a little bit of an issue, um, but we have a lot of good drugs. They work very well. Um, there's a sense of like, well, maybe this person may or may not need to be on them. Um, you know, I think it's a delicate situation, delicate sort of conversation to have. Um, they're often the first medication that's sort of, you know, if there's any issue that comes up, oh, we're worried about like bladder, you know, urinary retention, things like that. Um, so we want to just make sure that we're, we're really paying attention to kind of how important those medications are for, for patients uh, who are taking them. Um, I mentioned stigma earlier um, and, and just how important our recommendation from the medical field is uh, for this important use of longitudinal assessments, um, uh, you know, especially over the, the survivorship trajectory. I would be very careful about um, normalization because we do need to validate experience, validate symptoms, et cetera. But in terms, this is one of the issues um, with why, and I'm sort of the, the premise behind everything I'm saying is essentially that, you know, not enough patients are being treated for depression. Not enough patients are being, uh, being um, make it to psychosocial uh, interventions. And I can tell you that firsthand from my research. When I've asked patients, where do you prefer to be treated for depression? Uh, you know, like 75% say, you know, I just only want to be treated in, in the oncology clinic. So that's why this is so important. And what happens, and, and interestingly with the normalization, it's also the reason that, that doctors as patients don't get good care because we are heuristic. We make these assumptions that, um, oh, well, that's normal or they understand or, or that, that kind of thing. And unfortunately, especially when you, you sort of like a patient and you want the best for the patient, it's very common to, um, to, to uh, want them to sort of not be depressed or not feel that way. And so, um, you know, it's just something we kind of have to be, I used to say like normalization. Normalization is sort of an interesting issue 
um, overall. And, and anyway, the, 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 the downside of normalization is collusion, okay? And so also focusing in on reintegration. Um, these are the, some of the scales that are recommended by the American Cancer Society for screening for depression. Um, and they're fine scales, but I will make a plug for the PROMISE questionnaire only because what the PROMISE does is it, it's a composite of these le uh, legacy scales is, is kind of what they're called. And they haven't quite been, a, a PROMISE hasn't been adopted as, as much as they thought it would be. I think mostly because all the studies have you know, used these leg legacy scales. But what's really nice about them is that um, you can see that there's these different domains. And as I mentioned earlier, you know, depression sort of runs throughout all of these issues, right? Um, there's a little bit of a tendency to say, well, we want to resolve all these other issues and then we'll treat the depression. Well, no, you we sort of have to probably treat them all at the same time. Um, so just as take home points, I would say that awareness is the biggest issue and how we communicate about depression, um, how we talk to our patients about depression. Um, and we want to sort of like validate those symptoms and those experiences for the patient. Um, but not necessarily like normalizing it, like, like, oh, that's okay. Everyone gets a little sad after, after the, after, you know, what you're experiencing. Um, this is a treatable and it's a preventative comor comorbidity and it has survival implications. So, you know, we, we, um, we, you know, we need to continue all of our efforts. Now, interestingly, we really do have good treatments for depression. And so the field of psycho-oncology at this point is really focused on symptom or symptoms, uh, system issues of how do we get patients to these treatments, okay? So those are resources, those are implementation issues. Those are also things as a frontline um, oncologist or nurse practitioner seeing patients, like what are the key things that you say? You know, how, how do you help in the clinic? Um, uh, so yeah, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to my next uh, uh, colleague on the panel and I thank you for your, um, for your attention. All right, I am uh, aware of our time and I just wanna make sure that we leave some time for questions. So I apologize, it's gonna be a brief kind of fly through uh, body image distress uh, after the treatment of head and neck cancers. All I need to do is get it to advance, there we go. Uh, disclosures, I am an advisor on an R21 grant with Dr. Evan Grabois out of MUSC who holds a grant looking at CBT for body image distress in patients, which is very, uh, unique, and we're going to talk a little bit about that. So body image distress is a disorder characterized by this perception of displeasing changes in one's appearance or one's function and causes psychosocial distress. Traditionally, it's typically conceptualized in the eating disorder literature uh, and then the breast cancer literature. And so the, the current literature doesn't really capture the spectrum of body image concerns uh, that survivors of head and neck cancers have, uh, because a lot of times those, those uh, changes in one's body uh, and appearance with head and neck cancer are very different than the perceptions that people have with eating disorders or the um, other ways of covering up following breast cancer uh, treatment. We know that in the treatment of head and neck cancer, both the disease and its treatment result in very visible disfiguring um, outcomes in highly visible areas in the body. And they result in functional impairments such as communication, breathing, eating, smiling. Uh, and all of this can contribute to a social isolation, a stigmatization. Um, and as, as Dr. McFarland talked about depression, and there's also issues with decreased intimacy, both uh, emotional and physical intimacy, and an overall poor quality of life. When we look at body image distress in patients with head and neck cancers, uh, looking at it from just a strict um, using measures that we'd use in eating disorders or using measures that are typically used in the breast cancer literature, we see that about 13 to 20 percent of patients post-treatment report significant body image distress and that this is associated with depressive symptoms, younger age, problems with social contact, problems with wound healing, and the extent of the surgery that they had with those who underwent uh, reconstructive uh, 
surgery with free flaps, tending to have uh, worse body image issues. The distress is often related to appearance and function, which then translate into more issues uh, with the social problems. But we need better identification. So we knew that the, the body image scale wasn't cutting it for folks with head and neck cancers. Uh, and Dr. Grabois and his group at MUSC developed the uh, image head and neck. So it's an inventory to measure and assess image disturbance in head and neck cancer. And it has subscales looking at social avoidance and isolation, other oriented appearance concerns. So what other people are thinking of me, personal dissatisfaction with their appearance, functional impairment and kind of a global domain. And on that measure, what we see is up to 75% of survivors of head and neck cancer report significant body image distress on that image head and neck. And again, it's associated with the things that we would expect like free flap reconstruction, higher functional impairment, and it results in more frequent social avoidance. Now, because we know that there is very distinct areas that often come along with this, we see unhappiness, a focus on scars or asymmetry, dental concerns, swelling or lymphedema. Um, and that leads to folks naturally being very focused on nonverbal. Um, so the staring facial expressions, they looked at me weird, they must be thinking X, or those verbal comments from others um, and how that impacts one's willingness to, to go out in public. Oftentimes there is concealment or camouflage. Uh, it's really interesting as we, you know, spent the past year and a half wearing masks and uh, right before COVID hit, I was working with uh, a survivor who wouldn't leave the house without a mask. And this was before we, we knew about COVID. She wouldn't leave the house without a mask. And we were working on um, that kind of safety behavior of wearing the mask to, to conceal the, the scars and the asymmetric smile. Uh, and then masks came along. Uh, and it's, it's kind of been a bit of a game changer for those of us who work with folks with body image distress uh, and how we adapt treatment um, you know, social isolation and all of that sort of thing has really kind of changed that rubric. Uh, and you see an avoidance of social activities because of issues with eating, with speaking, with drinking in the presence of others, of coughing, of clearing secretions, of not eating an, um, a typical diet, of not being able to speak loud enough or clear enough to be heard, particularly in social situations. So most protocols, most treatment um, treatments out there for body image distress are really developed for those with eating disorders where there is not necessarily a um, objective uh, body image change, but it is more a subject of our perception uh, of body image change or with breast cancer um, or protocols within head and neck have really focused on cosmetic rehabilitation, um, so additional surgeries or procedures to decrease the um, visibility of the, uh, the impairments that are causing distress. Uh, because of this, there isn't a lot of research uh, supporting the cosmetic rehabilitation and head and neck related distress. The application of the protocols for eating disorders or breast cancer haven't worked out very well in folks with head and neck cancer uh, related distress. Uh, so Dr. Grabois and Dr. Maurer, uh, who's a health psychologist out at MUSC worked on developing a head and neck specific treatment and it's called the Building and Renewed Image After Head and Neck Cancer Treatment. Uh, otherwise known as the BRIGHT protocol, and it's based on cognitive behavioral intervention. It is time limited, uh, about five sessions at six, uh, 60 minutes each, and it's delivered via telemed because like most of these larger centers, we tend to pull people from all over the place and traveling weekly is, is not as convenient and the patients really liked telemedicine. And it targets the emotional, attitudinal and behavioral components related to head and neck uh, body image distress. So it looks at the identification of personal values, understanding interactions between those thoughts, feelings, and behaviors, the identification of those unhelpful thoughts and the development of helpful thoughts, looking at the avoidance behaviors and safety behaviors, and really working on tolerating emotional distress and distress tolerance. 
So some of the things we do, we look at those personal values. This is a good example of how to, how to look at personal values. It's called the life compass. And what you see are boxes of different important pieces of people's lives. And in the top uh, right of the box, you'll see like a little wee box. And then there's another little wee box below it. And it's, where are you right now? Where do you wanna be? And what sort of things in the larger box are important to you? And um, that helps people really define and see on paper where they're at and where they want to be and can help them set goals through this that can then help drive the treatment goals. I'm looking at the inter interactions of thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. You know, when you have this thought, it leads to a behavior and that behavior can then lead to a particular emotion that leads to more thoughts and helping people see the differences that are the connections between the thoughts, feelings, and behaviors, which is a very classic cognitive behavioral model and where you can intervene to then alter that pattern. Really looking at those unhelpful thoughts. So this is an example from the therapist manual for Bright, um, looking at you know, the situation that was related to body image, the thoughts that came up for you with your appearance or image, the feelings that came up and the behaviors that you did. And again, helping them link those thoughts, feelings and behaviors and looking at the different types of thoughts. So seeing thoughts as facts, that very black or white thinking, responding to expectations rather than reality mind reading of other individuals um, and really kind of working on identifying those thoughts to then learn how to talk back to the thoughts or how to restructure the thoughts and give them less power. Looking at the avoidance strategies and the safety behaviors. So oftentimes we have a, you know, the situation is I'm going out into public. I have increased physical symptoms. Um, of anxiety, of the need to engage in safety behaviors, such as, you know, wearing a scarf, wearing a mask, which these days makes perfect sense, but in the old days it didn't, um, not going out at all, seeking reassurance from our loved ones, being self-deprecating in a way that elicits reassurance from others. Um, and other types of checking behaviors and recognizing that those safety behaviors provide that short term release relief from the anxiety that the situation causes. But in the long term, it ends up shrinking your world and shrinking your world so that you're just not going out and nothing enjoyable occurs in your life and needing to walk that back a little. And really looking at how do you tolerate those tough emotions that come up? How do you work through them? How do you allow them to be there? How do you distract yourself from them? And developing those skills uh, for folks to manage the emotions that come up with it so that they can engage in the going out, even though those thoughts and feelings are there, so that they can engage in the social situations, even though the thoughts and feelings are there. And there are multiple ways to do that. You know, we do imagery, we find meaning encourage the use of uh, prayer and relaxation strategies, um, focusing on the moment or that mindfulness piece, um, really becoming your inner cheerleader and reminding yourself that you've done this before and you'll do it again. And other ways are really being able to use your five senses to kind of ground you in the moment. So sight, sound, touch, smell, and taste, uh, and really being able to ground yourself in the moment to then be able to step forward into the next one. And so we're hoping um, we've got the first piece of this study out. Uh, I think we're about 30 to 40 people in um, at MUSC and we're hoping to bring it out to a more multi-site study uh, to engage more folks in this. The next steps, uh, I wanna take a quick plug to make sure that we know how to access behavioral health, behavioral health treatment and behavioral partnership. So some of the ways that you can do this, you can call the number on the back of your insurance card. There's usually a number that says behavioral health or mental health. You can contact your county mental health services. You can contact your primary care provider or your cancer provider to see who they would recommend. Ask friends, family, neighbors, local online groups. Um, there are people out there getting treatment and they get treatment with people that they like. And so a re recommendation can always be helpful. And then knowing what to look for. You know, the, um, Dr. McFarlane is a psychiatrist. Those are usually the MDs, the DOs. Um, Dr. Cash and I are psychologists. 
their psychiatric advanced uh, practice providers, social workers, and licensed professional counselors that can, can really help to support and really get value back into life. And as Dr. McFarland mentioned, uh, suicide is, risk is very high in the head and neck cancer uh, population into survivorship up to 15 years, which is as long as they've studied it. So making sure that you, uh, both as providers and as uh, survivors, know the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. There's online chatting and there's a 1-800 number here. And I think that gives us a few minutes for questions and I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. McNeil. Thank you, Dr. Williams, and to the other two presenters, Dr. Cash and Dr. McFarland, those were some uh, great uh, interventions. Um, and hopefully we can just go over a few minutes for some questions. Um, there is a question from somebody in the audience wondering at what point it would be beneficial to a patient for a referral to be submitted for psycho-oncology for sleeping, or should they be referred back to their uh, medical doctor? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I would say that as soon as the um, the issue arises in a, a clinical setting, that it's it's worth mentioning that you know sleep um, impairments can definitely be difficult to deal with. They're very common for our patients who are dealing with cancer, and that um, you know a referral to either practitioner, the psycho oncology um, specialist, or back to the MD would be appropriate as soon as um, the patient brings that up and um, you know, the distinction between providers could be based on the patient's preference. They may be a patient who wants a, a medication to help in the short term and then um, may seek behavioral strategies in the long term, or it may be someone who is not interested in it, adding another medication to their regimen. And so they might prefer a, a referral to a psycho-oncologist who can help them with the behavioral sleep strategies that might you know, get them to where they need to be. So um, sooner rather than later is probably better, I would think. Um, I just have a question for Dr. McFarland about, I, I like how you mentioned about how patients just want treatment from their treating oncologists and their treating oncologist, not necessarily their oncologist, but their treating oncology care team. And that it's important to bring up issues of well, sleep and body image and also uh, depression. Can you give an example of how best to kind of address that with a patient without um, making them feel like, you know, we're um, uh, stigmatizing them? Yeah, no, great question. Um, and I think it's um, just so important. I mean, the, the the first thing is just letting the patient know what the roles are and saying that, and, and aligning yourself with um, with whoever that other care pr provider is, you know, um, so that it's sort of approached, it's sort of seen from the patient's perspective as, as one solid team. I don't think patients expect us to know everything, you know, and, and to sort of say like, you know, this is this is uh, Dr. So and so, whoever it is, and and we work together, and, and a lot of my patients see him or her, and um, you know, he or she is very helpful in uh, you know discussing these issues, et cetera. But you know, I think it's also just in the way that you ask about it, right? It's like just paying attention to the words that you use, um, and and the and the body language of and how you ask those questions. So. You know, to me, it's a little bit kind of like um, when I first started training, um, talking about suicide is uncomfortable, you know, and, and a lot of these questions are uncomfortable, you know, <laughs> so there's just no other, there's just no two ways about it. Like asking, do you think that you're depressed? Do you think you're having depression? Um, you know, but everyone develops their own style. Um, and, and that's why I was kind of trying to get at well, tell me about your relationships. Tell me what's, because some of those things are much easier to discuss at first, right? So tell me, tell me what your normal day is. Oh, that's interesting. You know, I wonder why that's happening. Um, but I think it's also at some point you do need to, you do need to ask, are you, or do you think you're having depression? Have you ever been depressed before? Um, and don't use any sort of, um, um, like, what, what, what's the word for that? Like uh, analogy, you know, like, like in, in, like in, su in suicide, we're like, well, sometimes we'll say, do you ever, I think you sort of get what I'm saying. Like you want to ask the question as, as, as what it is. Um, I hope that helps uh, to some extent. And I think, you know, also just talk to whoever is in your institute or, or um, you know, I think it's a great question and you could sort of make it local too, um, you know, 
how I could how I could do this better because it's impossible for me to just say you know everything that, that you could do right now but you kind of have to get it checked in with yourself first make sure you're comfortable with you're going to have to talk about this and once you do it a number of times you'll you'll get much better at it I think yeah and there was just a comment from one of the participants that the VA apps mindfulness insomnia CBTI and several others are all free because um, I know a lot of our patients have some significant uh, financial concerns um, and another question that I have for Dr. Cash is um, you know many of my patients in particular in Canada have a substance use problem. So how do you address kind of sleep hygiene when they're, you know, used to self-medicating with, you know, alcohol or other substances? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I think it comes down to a little bit of um, a discussion to, to help motivate them into the direction that might be most beneficial for them. So helping them understand, you know, um, you know, what, how the benefits of sleep might outweigh the benefits of a, of a particular substance um, just give it on any given day and um, you know helping helping them come to realize like uh, or, or to see you know how much those substances might they could help for, with sleep in the short term but in the long term they do disrupt certain stages of sleep and lead to um, greater sleep disruption accumulating um, over a long period of time even if someone feels they get adequate sleep and so um, yeah, I think it takes, um, you know, you can do a two pronged approach, you can definitely uh, work on um, mitigating the use of substances at the same time as working on some of those strategies to address um, sleep difficulties. Um, but I would, I would want, you know, that to be under the purview of a practitioner who has experience in both of those areas and can really closely monitor and make sure um, the patient is, is safe and not experiencing too many um, other untoward symptoms or side effects and able to keep everything manageable while they're navigating all of their other treatments that they probably have to deal with as well. So um, it can be done. Um, and it's just a matter of uh, making sure it's done safely and carefully. Um, did you have any questions, Marcy? No, I think you've handled them. You've made my job really easy. I just had to sit here. So, <laughs> um, so thank you all, everyone for attending and thank you to our panelists for a great presentation. I do wanna remind everyone that we do have one more um, session next week and that's gonna be um, defining the value of survivorship with David Cognetti, um, Brooke Worcester, and one of his patients that is really interested in kind of helping um, keep survivorship efforts alive through philanthropy and other mechanisms. And his name is David New. So I hope you all be able to join us. Um, again, thank you for your participation and attending. So I think with that, we'll end. Um, I will uh, end the meeting. If you have any questions, please uh, feel free to respond to the link in the email. That, uh, the invitation and we look forward to sharing this video with all of the participants as it's ready. Thank you and everyone have have a nice afternoon.